The injury played All Black number 1022 received the following message from a young fan. Dear Ali, I hope you get better soon. By the way, my dad says, why don't you drink concrete and harden up? <laughs> Rugby has been described as our greatest strength, our greatest weakness, and a sport that has got the better of us sometimes. Does it still mean as much to New Zealanders to defining who we are and where we stand in the world as it did in the past? Well, now, of course, is the perfect time to talk about the game that many love and some love to hate. In September 2011, as we proudly host the Rugby World Cup and tens of thousands of visitors flock here for games, most of the country is totally caught up in it. Even with an election looming, politicians are shrewd enough to realise that these next few weeks are more about the cup than the campaign, and maybe winning one could lead to a winning of the other, or the losing. But of course, politics and sport do not mix. We know that only too well from the events that shook this country to its core in 1981. It was 30 years ago that the Springboks toured and divided our nation and our families and our loyalties as no other issue has done before. The game of rugby certainly has had its highs and lows. And if we stand back and take an honest look at it, do we still define ourselves as a rugby nation? Three Kiwis with strong views and very persuasive arguments have joined us here at the Auckland Museum to discuss where rugby fits into our world. Jock Phillips, historian and general manager of Tiara, the online encyclopedia of New Zealand, author of many social history books, including A Man's Country, which included a chapter, The Hard Man, Rugby and the Formation of Male Identity in New Zealand. Dr. Jennifer Curtin, a political scientist from the University of Auckland, who studied how women have engaged with the game in its 150-year history here, and why so many women not only watch it, but also play it today. And Grant Fox, ex-All Black. Although, are you ever uh, an ex-All Black? Is it always the defining thing that... that uh, always now. <laughs> always, yeah. Well, Foxy, of course, is one of our greatest number 10s, whose legendary kicking skills helped us with the World Cup back in 1987, and they certainly can't take that away from you either. He's also a coach and a commentator. Please welcome all our panellists. I've heard there that, um, Grant, that, that all blacks, when men become all blacks, they're asked to make a sacrifice for the team. What sort of sacrifice did you have to make? We're not talking about abstinence, I don't think. We've <laughs> moved on a bit from, the, no, from that I one. I didn't have a telecom mobile phone then either. But um, <laughs> um, for me, I, w I mean, <clears throat> I would best describe, and it's not just about all black, it's about playing top level sport, full stop. Well, sport, full stop to a degree, but the higher you go up, the more sacrifice is required because of the travel involved in that. But I would describe it like this, that, that in all our lives, family is, is, um, family is the most important, but rugby comes first. <laughs> and um, that's, that, I mean, that's just, to, 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 that's about the team and what you need to do to be the best you can be to ensure that you help the team be the best it, it can be. It is true, though, and isn't it? All top-level athletes talk about that. <clears throat> the rowers, you know, people who want to succeed, they actually have to, at some point, be well, pretty selfish. With that. Don't, don't you think that, in fact, if you have a rounded family life, you'll probably end up as a better sports person? Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. The, the, our, our wives understood it implicitly um, because that was what... We chose to do it. We needed the support to do it. They underst understood what drove us, um, that it was like an addiction, that we, you know, a drug we needed. Is that what, what it was like for you? Yeah, you I were mean, driven. They don't, at the highest level, they don't call it a test match for nothing because you are testing yourself. Yeah. You know, it is the ultimate challenge um, for a sportsman to represent their country against someone else. That's why they call them test matches. And, and that addiction is... I want to prove that I'm good enough and get the high, get the high out of it. And the high comes from winning because losing sucks. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Ain't and, that the truth? Yeah, and, and you know, when you lose, you want to get back on the horse quickly so that you can get rid of that feeling and get that, dru get that, get that drug again. Yeah. Well, rugby players generally, let's look at some of the contentious things, because there have been a few over the years. The 1981 Springbok Tour, you know, we're, we're looking down the barrel of their 30th anniversary, and believe me, if you've had discussions about it with your friends recently or with people you know, it's still a hot topic. It's still contentious, and passions run high. Uh, I wonder where we all stood on that one. Before we get into the personal stuff, I mean, uh, Jennifer, for, for you, when you're looking at that and analysing it as a point of time, uh, did rugby change as a result of it? 
Well, I think from, from a um, agenda perspective, it, it had quite a lot of significance. It, it happened at a time when the women's movement was in full swing anyway, as well as the civil rights movement. But also what we see as a result of um, the Springbok tour is um, the gender relations within families get quite severely challenged and we see families being split along gender lines with women being more likely to be anti-tour quite often than their, um, their husbands who were rugby supporters. And, and there's um, some wonderful letters in the, in the National Library that, that review the, the National Council of Women's stand on this, for example, which is a very moderate women's organisation, but at the national and international level had, um, had signed up to the Glen Eagles Agreement and supported this. But, but women who were local members of the National Council of Women found it really difficult to kind of um, to, to juggle this, their associations anti-tour perspective with their husband's pro-tour perspective, and and for many families for a long time, um, the discussion of the tour was really a difficult thing, and working out where they stood on this, and and certainly even women who I speak to now, whose mothers were married to rugby men at that time, a lot of those families they just chose to stay at home rather than engage. It was the easiest thing to do. They didn't want to have to either go to a game, nor did they want to be risking themselves in protest activity, or, or they just didn't know the best way to deal it, with it, and so they actually abstained, in a way. Mm. You've, you've looked at the motivation for why people protested and the numbers that they did during the Springbok tour. What, what, what was the range of reasons why people stood against it? Yeah, Maggie, what, what we did is on the last two um, protest marches in Wellington, um, I got together a group of students and we issued, our, we issued um, questionnaires and then we analysed the um, people who were on the mailing list for the anti-tour movement in Wellington and sent them all questionnaires. So we ended up with a sort of profile of about a thousand people and it was very interesting what came through. The first thing that came through was that the people who were actually marching were not really young people at all. They actually were people in their 30s. They were people who, in 1981, had sort of grown up in the 1940s and the 50s, who'd first started to protest during the Vietnam War, and who basically um, were, 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 were a sort of crucial generation of who were challenging the identity of New Zealand. But they were we not all used to protesting. They, they were. were. That wasn't the first protest they'd yep. been on. And secondly, when we asked them why they were protesting, two things came through really loud and clear. One was that they were protesting about apartheid. But secondly, they were protesting about what the identity of the country was. They really saw it as a statement about what New Zealand stood for in the world. Their argument quite often was that they felt rugby had been too defining in terms of national identity. I'll, I'll, I'll remember one woman wrote in and said that she grew up in North Canterbury, it was Alex Wiley country, all her life she'd felt that rugby defined her community and defined her culture. She was marching because she wanted to express a protest against the domination of that point of view. And it's, it's always seemed to me that New Zealand's national identity came to be bound up with rugby at the very beginning of the 20th century, at a time when um, the All Blacks, the 1905 All Blacks, I'm going back a bit, but yeah, I think this are, is important. The 1905 All Blacks went to, went to um, Britain and overwhelmingly had a... In fact, I think they scored 839 points to 29 against them. I mean, it was overwhelming Resounding. victories. And the country was hugely excited. And people in Britain said, hey, wait a minute. Who are these people from the, from the colonies? What are they doing? There was a huge concern in Britain because there was a fear that the Anglo-Saxon race was becoming degenerate. And in fact, there was a parliamentary inquiry on the degeneracy of the Anglo-Saxon race. And when they saw the All Blacks, they said, these are our salvation. We don't need to worry about England becoming decadent. The New Zealanders are our salvation. And 
The people in New Zealand, of course, I mean, once New Zealanders are flattered by people overseas, once people overseas take notice and say, you're blimmin' marvellous, New Zealanders love it. So before very long, the, 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 the um, politicians in New Zealand, particularly Dick Seddon, declared himself Minister of Football, and he gave them the reward of a free trip around the United States. It was called the American Picnic. Shameless. Great and statement. he went out and greeted them when they arrived in Auckland Harbour. So from that point on, New Zealand, you know, the state had basically said, New Zealand's identity is bound up with the All Blacks. And it became fused very easily with the reputation of New Zealand soldiers. And particularly when the Invincibles, the 1924 All Blacks, went round Britain, if you look in the programs at that point in time, half of the programs are about the way in which the New Zealand Expeditionary Force had been so successful on the Western Front, and the All Blacks are exactly the same. These are examples of superior manhood. So that, you know, from that point on, playing rugby well was absolutely central to New Zealand identity. Now in 1981, it always seemed to me, in a sense what we were doing, what people were doing, was challenging the centrality of that definition of New Zealand to the national identity. It was that significant? I think it was absolutely a crucial moment. There was a big, big question about who are we? I mean, you know, Greg McGee did that famous play, Forskin's Lament, mm. and the great question was, what are you? That was the question he asked. Mm. And the answer depended, really, on whether you thought rugby was central to identity, whether rugby was just a game, or whether, in fact, we were becoming a multicultural society which stood for international values of freedom of expression and anti-racism and so forth. So, Grant, where were you in all this? What are you? <laughs> what am I? I was 19 or 20 at the time. Yeah. Um, and, and for me, the Springboks represented the greatest challenge. Um, the, at that stage, they had a team that had a better winning record than the All Blacks. And it was, they were our major foes in those days. And so the chance to see um, the Springboks play against the All Blacks in New Zealand from a rugby point of view was appealing. So in that regard, I was obviously for the tour because it was about rugby for me. Um, I didn't see the link between sport and politics. I still don't see the link, to be honest, because I think they should be kept separate, but maybe they can't be. But that's the view um, that I had at the time. Um, so that's what it was. So how many women are playing rugby these days? Um, girls and women, about 14,000 nationwide. So um, mostly they play integrated rugby with the boys until they're 13. Then um, once they go to high school, they play in... Um, girls only teams and actually at Matarangi College a couple of years back the women's or well, the girls first 15 was better than the boys first 15 um, so there's some competition going on there and then we see um, the numbers drop off a bit once once they leave high school and some unions are more explicitly supportive of women's rugby than others. 14,000 women what are the numbers on the men and boys playing? Uh, the latest figures were there are 136,000 uh, people in playing rugby in New Zealand. Of those, round about half were under the age of 12. Um, so the numbers aren't great if you think of it as a national game. When, when the, latest, the, Spark, the latest Spark survey on um, asking people what physical activity they had done over the last 12 months, and it turned out that rugby is 21st equal in terms of all physical activities. Gardening would be higher. <laughs> Walking is higher, gardening is higher. Golf is actually the leading sport. If you just confine it to sports, golf is the leading sport and rugby is about ninth most popular in terms of participation. Round about 5% of all people over the age of 16 in New Zealand play rugby. So it's not a great number. Uh, and interestingly enough, if you break down the people who play rugby in New Zealand, almost half, about 48% of them, are Polynesians, are either Māori or Pacific Islanders. So I was 
suggesting just before we came in here that rugby is increasingly becoming a Polynesian game watched by rich white people. <laughs> this was something uh, that I think you would probably guess Grant did not necessarily agree with. Well, and why would that be, Grant? The rich white people thing I don't agree with because rugby's a game that, that crosses blue collar, white collar. So I don't, I don't think it's just about rich white people. But I'm not, I'm not going to dispute the facts about the percentages of um, Pacific Islanders and the influence they have. I mean, they percentage-wise, they'll be a greater part of our society than they used to be 30 years ago, I guess. And so, it's, and with the physical prowess they being, the physical specimens they are, it stands to reason that this game suits them quite well, and they're quite damn good at it. And, and they mature. I mean, it's well documented. They mature before um, the Europeans do, and so. You know, there you get that um, uh, inequity. Is that the right word? It's sort of from a physical strength point of view, which is intimidating for the smaller kids. Uh, I and mean, I did spend a little bit of time coaching and went round and, and at school level too, and, and saw first in rugby, first hand, and club rugby in Auckland. And you know, there is, you know, uh, certain a lot of Polynesian and Maoris compared to, to Europeans playing, no doubt about that. And that's just reflected in what we see at that the higher levels of the game too. <laughs> I mean, what I'm saying about the rich white people, Grant, is that, I mean, in the 1950s, the, grains, the grounds had those big embankments and everybody went along. I mean, when the, when the Springboks played... There they are now. Look at when them. the Springboks played in um, Gisborne in 1956, 22,000 people came along and watched the, the, the Springboks play in Gisborne and the population of Gisborne was 21,000. I mean, this was a huge social phenomenon. Well, that's simply not the case nowadays. And basically, you've got to pay money, obviously, to go and watch games. Increasingly, the game, the, 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 the embankments, the standing embankments have gone. You, 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 you pay to sit. You may well pay in corporate boxes. And if you're going to watch it, you can no longer really effectively watch it on free-to-air television. You have to basically have a Sky subscription. So the game as the game of the masses, as it used to be, seems to be no longer the case. So when it uh, all comes down to it, we could talk about this till the cows come home, but we need to wrap it up pretty soon. Jennifer, where do you stand on it, having said your piece and heard what the others have to say? Do we still define ourselves as a rugby nation, do you think, in 2011? <laughs> I, think, I think there are ebbs and flows. I think right now we're defining ourselves as a rugby nation. I also think other countries define us as a rugby nation, and so we reflect what is put upon us. So the French team get off the plane yesterday or the day before and go, oh, I really want to come and play rugby here. This is a rugby nation. I got interviewed by Sky Television in Italy. The first thing they asked me is, isn't rugby like a religion in New Zealand? You know, so the impression is that we are a rugby nation and at various times we choose to project that <coughs> outwards, I think, to the world and right now is that moment. You always thought we were a rugby nation and how we defined ourselves. You played the game, you've watched the game, you, as an historian, know the, the rules of engagement over a long period of time. Jock Phillips, where do you stand on it now? Well, I basically thought that I defining New Zealand as a rugby nation was selling us far, far too short. That we're a much, much more interesting, varied people than that. I mean, what I'm looking forward to over the next six weeks is actually the, way, the different ways, the varied ways in which New Zealand is going to present itself to the world. I mean, I'm about to set off for six weeks going around looking at the Real New Zealand Festival, which consists of art shows, opera shows, but also things like the Bluff Oyster Festival, um, farmers markets, a whole range of different things that are being put on for World Cup visitors. And I mean, we after all are a country that's won Oscars, that's won the America's Cup. We're not really defined now, it seems to me, in the eyes of the world, simply by yeah. our rugby. And I, I'm absolutely delighted about this. If we're good at rugby, that's one of the things we're good at, and I hope we win. But I basically hope that what happens over the next six weeks is that people come to this place and find it a really interesting, creative, vital society. And that is far more important than whether or not we win the World Cup.
<laughs> Brown Fox, what do you think? Are we still defined as a rugby nation? <laughs> um, I'm, you know, my, I hope more than anything out of this Rugby World Cup that um, we leave a legacy. And the legacy is about um, us being great hosts. So that we leave, the people who come, um, who, who then leave our shores, go away saying, we want to come back. This is a cool place. The people were great. Um, they tell their friends and family. Um, that's the long-term legacy around tourism. We get business investment. If we can win the World Cup as well, that's the icing on the cake. But here's a hand on heart from an old All Black, and I must be getting mellow in my age. Um, um, being great hosts is more important longer term than us winning the Rugby World Cup. All that's right, so there you go. We, we, we might be able to have a cake and eat it too, I hope. Um, <laughs> you know, the, defining ourselves as a rugby nation, and I'll, I'll be very quick here, Maggie, um, it is a huge part of our identity, but I think we've, we've moved on a bit, and there are a lot of other really good things about New Zealand that we should be proud of. But, you know, why is it defined as our national game? Why is it so important to us? Simply for me, I mean, it's, a, it's a way, more a way of life than a religion, uh, and that's changing a little bit. But it was almost part of the school curriculum when I was growing up. You know, that was ac that was, it was access accessible and you had to play it, essentially. And there was less choice then than there, was, than there is now. Um, you know, we have the best team in the world most of the time, not all of the time. And, you know, we're a pimple on the world's backside. We're geographically isolated uh, or challenged, if you like. Um, you know, we are a destination, not a location. And so it's something for us to be proud about because we can beat the rest of the world most of the time and I think that's something to feel good about. And the last thing I would say is, uh, from an all-black point of view, the all-black brand is massive around the world, much more so than people realise. You go, I've just been to America. Right? A lot of people in America know who the all-blacks are, but they wouldn't know who the wallabies or the springboks are, but they know the all-blacks. They might even know where New Zealand is, but they've heard of this team. Um, serious. You go to France, it's scary. They revere the all-blacks more so than here. Right, hand on heart, more so than here. It's scary. Um, <laughs> so, you know, uh, I mean, it is part of our national identity, but I agree with the last part of what Jock says in particular. I think that we've matured a bit as a nation. I certainly hope we have if, if we don't go so well at the World Cup. <laughs> so that's, the, that's the bit that worries me about. On that note, yeah, anyway. you, thank you all very much. Grant Fox, Dr Jennifer Curtin and Jock Phillips are my guests. I'd like to thank them all for their contributions.